let's continue talking about motion graphs. So position versus time, velocity versus time, and acceleration versus time. Uh, and we are going to use these graphs to come up with the four equations of constant acceleration. Uh, but first, a quick review. Uh, here's a position versus time graph representing a constant velocity. Uh, this object starts at position x naught or x initial. Uh, when time is equal to zero, it moves with a constant speed in the positive x direction. Um, this is linear. The slope represents the velocity. Um, since it's linear, we can model this uh, in the form y is equal to mx plus b, the slope intercept form. And we literally take the labels on our axes and we pop them into uh, y is equal to mx plus b. So instead of y, we're going to say mm, the position x. Instead of m to represent slope, we're going to literally pop in v for velocity, uh, time on the x-axis, and then our y-intercept uh, is x naught, just the initial x position. Um, and if we rearrange this a little bit, we can say that uh, v is equal to the change in x over t, which is the definition of uh, average velocity. Okay. Um, it is important to note that this particular velocity equation is only valid when acceleration is zero, when your object is not accelerating, when it is not speeding up or slowing down uh, or changing direction. Okay, so if we were to take this position graph and we were to convert it into a velocity graph, um, since the position graph we were looking at was constant velocity, right, the velocity function is just going to be a constant, so it could be like, I don't know, 10 meters per second. Okay, the slope of this line represents the acceleration, and this line, since it is horizontal, has a slope of zero, right, which ties in as uh, what we just spoke about on that last one. Okay, uh, another interesting thing about a velocity versus time graph is that the area of the velocity versus time graph is your displacement, or your delta x. So here is a second uh, example. So this is no longer constant velocity here. We have an object uh, starting with a speed of zero and then getting faster and faster as it travels in the negative x direction. Okay, Just like before, we know that the slope of this graph represents the acceleration, okay? and the area of this graph represents the displacement. Uh, let's go ahead and try and reverse engineer that position versus time graph. So here at the beginning, at time equals zero, looking at the velocity graph, at time is equal to zero, the velocity is equal to zero, which means, looking back at the position graph on the left, we start with a flat graph, okay? Where I'm just going to draw a little horizontal tick mark uh, to indicate that the slope at that point is equal to zero. I know that since this velocity is always negative, okay, it's never positive, that velocity graph is always below my time axis, uh, that must mean my final position must be to the left or, or in the negative direction uh, as compared to my starting position. So I'm going to draw a little point uh, down there below x initial. Okay. To figure out the shape of this graph, I'm going to look at how the velocity changes over time. So at the beginning, the velocity is zero. At the end, the velocity is well, a non-zero number, right? Uh, if this is going by ones, the velocity would be negative two, okay? So that would mean that on my position graph, the slope would be like negative two. So I'm gonna draw a downward sloping little dash mark, okay, right at my end point. So I've got two little dash marks there, and I'm just gonna connect them with a nice smooth curve, like so. So going back to the area of your velocity versus time graph is the displacement. That looks like on the position graph, well, it's just the difference between your starting point and your ending point. Okay, so that right there is delta x, which corresponds to the area of the triangle. Um, the other maybe interesting point on this graph is where it intersects that time axis. For this position graph, or for any position graph, um, a horizontal intercept isn't going to be particularly meaningful. It's the moment in time where the object is passing that reference point. Okay, it's still continuing to the left. It is still speeding up. It doesn't really alter its motion just by passing by that point. 
Okay, so let's look at this third sample velocity graph. Um, here we have an object that starts with an initial positive velocity um, that is going to get faster and faster and faster as it goes. Okay, let's say I want to figure out where that object is uh, at a particular point in time. I could look at the area of this graph, right? So the shape that I have shaded is a trapezoid, uh, and the formula for which is one half base one plus base two times height. Um, so converting our, you know, purely geometric mathematical symbols into physical ones, right? The area of this graph represents the displacement delta x. Uh, base one, it's going to be the left side of that trapezoid, v naught. Uh, b two is going to be that final velocity. Um, and so for that, I just use the letter V. Uh, sometimes I'll put a little subscript F on that uh, to distinguish between the initial and the final velocities. And then uh, the height of this trapezoid is time, so it's kind of like laying on its side. Um, a mildly interesting thing to note here is that the one half parentheses V naught plus V term does represent the average velocity of the object, assuming a constant acceleration. Um, if we wanted to write an equation for this velocity graph using um, slope-intercept form, it might look something like this. So again, fitting this to y is equal to mx plus b, right? On our y-axis, we have velocity. The slope of our velocity graph is acceleration, okay? The horizontal axis is time, and the y-intercept here is the initial velocity v naught. Rearranging that, we actually get the definition of acceleration. Uh, that acceleration is defined as the change in velocity over time. Okay, so straight from looking at that graph, we looked at the geometry of the graph, the area under the curve, um, to get a function for displacement, and then we looked at y is equal to mx plus b to get this v is equal to v naught plus at uh, equation for that. Now, we can mash these equations together algebraically. So here's those two equations again. I'm going to take the y equals mx plus b, the v is equal to at plus v naught equation, and I'm going to plug that in to my displacement one. Okay, so a little bit of algebra. I won't bore you by talking all the way through that. Okay, you combine like terms, you distribute, everything is great. Uh, you come up with the expression delta x is equal to v naught times t plus one half at squared. This, remember that uh, second example that we did? It was on the bottom of that first page. We drew a quadratic position graph whenever we have a linear velocity graph, as in linear with like a non-zero slope. Okay, so anytime you have a velocity graph that uh, is changing at a constant rate, that is, is linear, um, then your position graph is going to be quadratic. All right, last but not least, a little bit more algebra shenanigans. I've rearranged the v is equal to at plus v naught equation into time is equal to v minus v naught all over a. I'm going to take that and I'm going to plug that in to our same trapezoid equation as before. So I'm going to replace time with this equation. So again, just a little bit of algebra. Uh, this one's a little more intensive. You might have a flashback to algebra 2. It's the difference between two perfect squares. Uh, but if you, if you foil that out, you end up with uh, 2ax is equal to v final squared minus v initial squared. Rearranging that so everything is positive. Uh, we generally write it in this form, v squared is equal to v naught squared plus 2a delta x. So uh, these four equations describe constant acceleration. Each equation is missing one variable, so the area of the trapezoid equation, it does not have acceleration in it at all. Okay, That second uh, y is equal to mx plus b variation doesn't have anything about displacement or position in it. Okay, The third equation... Uh, doesn't have anything about final velocity. So if you're working through a problem and there's no mention of, you know, how fast was it going at the end, then you can use this third equation. And then for this uh, final equation, there's no mention of time. Okay, this is the time-independent uh, constant acceleration equation. So uh, with all this, let's go ahead and do a sample problem.
the problem solving method that you choose, it kind of really depends on how you tend to think. If you think uh, more in terms of equations than you do in graphs, then you can just, you know, grab an equation and go. But I always think, like as I've done this for a longer and longer amount of time, the graphs are super useful. Uh, if, if I can visualize each of the motion graphs, that kind of helps me check my work and makes sure that my answers are logical. So I'm gonna start by kind of talking through this graphically. So at first, we have a constant acceleration of 2.5 meters per second squared, okay? So that means there's gonna be just a horizontal line uh, from time equals zero to time equals four, okay? and that horizontal line is at 2.5 meters per second squared, okay? After that, if the gazelle is gonna be traveling at a constant speed or constant velocity, that means the acceleration is gonna be zero. So we have like a stair step drop down to acceleration equals zero, okay? at and after time is equal to four. Okay, so if we're gonna make a velocity graph off of this, okay, well, hmm, I know that the slope of my velocity graph is acceleration, so the fact that the acceleration is 2.5 meters per second squared for the first four seconds, that means I'm gonna draw um, a line that goes up and to the right with a slope of 2.5 meters per second squared from time equals zero to time equals four. When the acceleration drops back down to zero, okay, notice my velocity doesn't drop down to zero, but the slope of my velocity graph, which remember is acceleration, right? The slope will change to zero, okay? But the velocity value will stay the same as it says in the, in the question. Okay, so with this, now we look at our position graph, okay? So the area of this function all together is 100 meters. So I know that if we start at x equals zero, then we should be ending at x equals 100, right? And I know that my motion changes at time equals four, okay? So thinking about what is happening if my velocity graph was just, you know, has a positive linear slope, right? I know from the last sample problem that that should be curvy, should be quadratic. Then when the slope of my velocity graph is flatter, when my velocity is not changing, right, then my position graph should be linear, okay? So there, there's an interesting thing happening right at time equals four. So kind of quadratic um, between time equals zero and time equals four, well, there's no kind of about it. It is, it is quadratic, right, at that time. And then at time equals four, it goes from quadratic to linear. And this is kind of tricky, but you, you want it to have the same slope, okay, when you are drawing your sketch. Okay, these graphs are obviously not to scale. I have no idea if the things are the right size or not, but this is kind of, in general, the shapes that we are looking for. Okay, if you're asked to sketch something, we are just looking for general shapes, general points of interest, um, like if the motion changes. So a question that might be asked about this uh, situation is, what is the gazelle's speed and what is the gazelle's position at time equals two? As you read through the question, you should write down all those numerical values. Write down all your givens. Um, then, okay, you look at what you have, and then you look back at your four equations, and you pick the one that fits the best. Um, so here I've got all the variables except for displacement. So I should choose this one, okay? This is the velocity versus time equation of the line there. So write that down, plug in your numbers, and we find that the gazelle is going five meters per second at time equals two. Okay, for her position, uh, we got the same sets of variables. Ooh, if you're a little skeptical about whether you did the previous part right, um, you'd want to pick an equation that doesn't use that answer. So I chose this equation, x equals v naught times t plus one half at squared. Plugging in numbers, that first term goes away since the initial velocity was zero. I'm left with just one half at squared. And I get that the gazelle is five meters away from her starting point, okay? So now same pair of questions again, but now at time equals four. So just kind of expectations. Um, I would expect for the gazelle to be going faster than she was at time equals two. And I would expect the gazelle to have gone farther 
than she was at time equals two. Okay, so same equations again. I'm just replacing the two with a four. Okay, so the gazelle is moving at 10 meters per second and continues moving at that same speed of 10 meters per second um, until she reaches 100 meters away. Okay, and then uh, at time equals four, she's covered 20 out of her 100 total meters. All right, last question. How long until she reaches the x equals 100 meter mark? Okay, so looking back at this velocity graph, this is, I think, one uh, that almost lends itself better to solving graphically than it does to writing equations. You could certainly do that uh, and get the same answer as well. But um, we know from the first bit of the problem that we did, right, that the area of this leading triangle on the velocity graph is 20 meters. Okay, if she's traveling 100 meters, that must mean that the area of the rectangle that's left, that must be 80, right? Because 80 plus 20 is 100. Okay, I also know that the height of this rectangle is 10 meters per second. So, writing down the area of this rectangle formula, right? So the area is 80, right? The height is 10, and then the base, I'm going to say that it's t minus 4 right, because I'm not looking at the area of the triangle, uh, I'm just looking at the area of this rectangle here. You could also just, you know, call it t additional or something like that if you wanted to solve it that way. Um, when you rearrange and solve, you get 12 seconds total. And that's it. That's kind of how you'd work through and take advantage of both uh, the equation writing side and the graphical side uh, in order to solve a kinematics problem.